So, 2021. Why is every year gonna be like this? Huh. So, here we are again. Okay, I'm exaggerating. 2021 was great for me in a lot of respects. I should count my blessings. I made more content this year than I have in most years prior, and there's more that I want to make in the year ahead. My non-YouTube work fell into a stable, livable groove. I finally got a PS5, a new gaming PC, and a VR headset. That's exciting. Though, it does put me far ahead of the vast majority of other video game enthusiasts right now. I was able to catch up because, in the middle of a massive, ongoing semiconductor shortage, I I seriously lucked out. I got vaccinated for COVID-19 three times. That was cool. Now, if, or when, I catch the deadly disease, it probably won't be deadly for me. I also finally got a car after years of relying on public transit and, ugh, wow, you don't realize how much Anchorage is built to favor drivers over pedestrians until you become a driver yourself. It's honestly really unfair and broken in a systemic kind of way. Honestly, if 2021 was a shocking bad year with dramatic twists and sudden turns for the worst, 2021 was more of a dull hum of bad. Yeah, there was that big explosive traumatizing event at the beginning, but the year transitioned into more of a depressing acceptance that this pandemic is going to continue that it's going to screw over disabled and immunocompromised people as we get pushed back to work, that higher-ups want to go back to a normal, quote-unquote, that most people now realize they were absolutely miserable in. And that vibe kind of applied to the video games of 2021 as well. This year saw the market take a good, long, hard look at what it wanted to be, at what it wanted to represent, and again, while the folks in charge definitely wanted to give the affectation that a lot of change needs to happen, their actions speak spoke a louder, it is what it is. Can't worry about crunch if you're too busy worrying about misogynistic work culture. Can't worry about misogynistic work culture if you're too busy worrying about NFTs. Fun? Who needs fun? Fun is overrated. Get back to work. Amidst all this were a lot of smaller budget titles and games that weren't so much commercial successes as they were critical successes, and I found that my usual top 10 list this year was dominated by either titles that often went overlooked by mainstream audiences, or remasters of games that stand out more today than they did back in their heyday. 2021 proved to be a surprisingly good year for re-examining media that were previously considered mediocre or bad, huh? So let's take a cautious step back towards positivity and look at my top 7 games of 2021, plus 3 others that were relevant because of re-releases. Deal with it. Oh, and the usual disclaimer applies here, your favorite might not be on here because I didn't play everything. Inscription and Guardians of the Galaxy are still on my to playlist. Sorry Drax. You Earthers have hangups. Okay, for real, let's go. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword came out in 2011, a few months after I graduated from high school, and I bounced right off of it. 2011 was a landmark year for games. This was the year of Skyrim, of Dark Souls, of Portal 2 and Arkham City. Supergiant Games had started a winning streak with Bastion, a streak that has yet to really end. Minecraft had entered 1.0. Deus Ex made a somewhat successful comeback. It was also the year of a new, huge, 3D console Zelda game, and compared to the games above, I think most can say that the reception to it was pretty mixed. And I suspect that the presence of other, more popular Zelda-likes like Arkham City and Dark Souls made a lot of Skyward Sword's flaws more obvious. Putting the motion controls aside, Skyward Sword is a game that just keeps going. The game's pacing just stretches on and on, having the player backtrack slowly through areas that are uninteresting to backtrack through. The sky is a nihilistic hellscape that torturously needed at my very soul every single time I flew up there. Several of the game's locations, and even one of the dungeons, are reused to pad the game's length out to an exhausting degree. And like, I'm not gonna pretend that Skyrim didn't do the same, but at least Skyrim had fast travel. Skyward Sword has slow travel. I'm sorry, hopefully I'll have written a better pun by the time I record this. And in the original release, for me, 
the motion controls broke every few minutes or so and required recalibration. And in case you youngins don't know what recalibration meant in 2011, that meant you had to place the remote on a flat surface and then pick it back up again every few minutes. In 2011, I made it about as far as the ancient cistern before I decided that I just didn't want to do the rest of the game. I was an adult, I had the money for other consoles and games, and Skyward Sword was not cutting it. In 2021, a little less than 10 years later, Nintendo released the Switch version, Skyward Sword HD, and the quality of life features they added to it were game-changing enough that I was able to bring myself to finish the game. And like, this came out in a busy month. This was the same month as Neo The World Ends With You, Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, and Death's Door. It was now cutting it. The remaster minimizes Fi's interruptions and lets me speed through the dialogue faster so I can read it at super speed with my post-liberal arts degree melange-induced mentat mind. The motion controls are easier to recalibrate with a single button press, are usually more accurate, and there's a button-only mode that I eventually gravitated towards once my arms and wrists decided that they had had enough. The pacing issues are still there, but at least I'm not adding arm soreness on top of the existential nightmare this time. That's the primary reason that I'm putting this game on my top 10 list, despite it being a remaster. The changes are enough that, for me, this may as well be a new game. And it turns out, 18-year-old DQP stopped playing this game before literally the best parts. The later dungeons are some of the coolest dungeons in all of Zelda. The boss fights are all slam dunks. I was genuinely surprised at how much I didn't hate the Silent Realm. And oh my god, just everything about the time shift stones are cool as hell, and I was absolutely giddy every time they showed up. To think, I was missing out on all that stuff because of frustrating mechanics that would get tweaked in the future. There was a buried gem in my Wii library for 10 years, and I didn't have the patience to dig it up until a new version came out and removed some of the dirt, and charged 60 bucks for it. I'm, I'm not as angry about that because inflation is a thing, but I'm not going to try and change people's minds about it. I have to wonder, how much of that is the work of Nintendo and Tantalus, adding all of these features and making the game more accessible? And how much of that is me, with an older, wiser, and more patient brain, less hungry for big, grand AAA adventures, and with a stronger understanding of what I want out of video games? It's hard to say. But yeah, Skyward Sword HD is great. It's still the same quality roller coaster that it was 10 years ago, but at least some of the drops are a little less hair raising this time around. You learn a lot of things playing remasters of Skyward Sword and Near Replicant back to back. I was shocked at how similar they were. They're both remasters of seventh generation action games that released around 10-ish years ago. They both fall back on a frustrating habit of making the player do a lot of filler to get to the story's real dramatic heft. And they're both twisted, cruel parodies of the 3D Zelda formula. Got him. But on a more serious note, it's genuinely fascinating to compare the two, especially in terms of themes. So, like, the protagonists of Skyward Sword and Near Replicant, self-named DQP and DQP respectively, are both fighting for a girl. DQP fights to rescue Zelda, and DQP fights to rescue Yona. But with that same basic premise, the games obviously go in two wildly different directions. In Skyward Sword, almost every major character grows in some way. DQP, Zelda, and Groos all have to put their egos and their agency aside in order to fulfill their roles in a legend that will save the world. They are are working to make the world a better place, to stop a cruel and unjust evil from taking over the land. And it works. It's a very effective story. Nier's characters work differently. DQP remains singularly focused on saving Yona at whatever cost is necessary. They kill a lot of shades and a lot of innocent people in order to try and make that happen. They aren't in this to save the world. They're in this to save their sister, and almost no one else. The two big characters who have to change are the talking book and the talking skeleton, and they wind up changing not because the world demands it from them, but because, well, because their personal friends demand it from them. Everyone else, DQP, Kaine, Devola, Popola, the Shadow Lord, the f***ing Lighthouse Lady, they all dig their heels into the ground and demand that the world change for them, for their friends, for their family, and for themselves. And a lot of people die for that. DQP never stops killing and killing and killing and killing until literally right before the canon ending when they and the player collectively decide, you know what, maybe 
I'm being the asshole here. I was surprised at how thematically different Near Replicant turned out to be from its more popular franchise-defining sequel, Near Automata. Automata and Replicant are both long and deeply introspective experiences that force the player to confront their own morality in times of stress and trauma. Like, keep in mind that Replicant was influenced in part by 9-11 and the War on Terror, and Automata was influenced in part by Brexit and Donald Trump's 2016 campaign. Both games take take place during times of extreme conflict and force their characters, and by extension the player, to really carefully think about what's important in those conflicts. What matters? Replicant's answer was, well, not killing, that's for sure, because DQP goes on what can be charitably described as a genocidal rampage to save a singular person, and the player is made to feel extraordinarily shitty for it. Automata's answer was, similarly, well, not killing. But by putting the enemies are worthy of empathy twist more towards the beginning than towards the end, it was allowed to sit in those themes for a bit longer. It was more meditative. It let more of its characters grow, realize their mistakes, and try to improve and find meaning in a cruel world. There was something strangely uplifting in it that is a bit more lacking in Replicant. And not to be spoilery, but this is something that they try to address in the new ending that they added in this re-release? In that regard, Near Replicant is a fascinating historical relic. Do I think it holds up as well as Automata? Uh, even putting themes aside, I don't think so. Replicant tightens the original's combat, but leaves in the obscene amount of padding it makes the player go through before showing them the whole story. But as someone who was affected by Automata's themes, I found Near Replicant to be powerful nonetheless. It's bullshit, but it's bullshit with a point, goddammit, and its writing works in spite of, nay, because of it. Damn, 2021 turned out to be a real good year for long-awaited sequels to really old games, huh? A sequel to The World Ends With You is a hard sell, and I don't just say that because it was factually a hard sell. It's a sequel to a niche DS game that had weird controls and mechanics, which makes it hard to port to modern hardware and thus have modern access to. No, scratch that. It's a sequel to the bonus episode from the compromised Switch port of a niche DS game that had weird controls and mechanics which made it hard to port to modern hardware and thus have modern access to. That sucks, because Neo The World Ends With You is really, 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 really good. Like, one of my favorite JRPGs of the year. And it was a stacked year for JRPGs. And Twooey, that's what all the hip kids are calling it, yo, had a lot to live up to. Again, they had to translate this to this, and I was shocked at how well they pulled it off. The combat mechanics in Entui are really good at feeling similar to the originals while still introducing new ideas. It evokes the same feelings of teamwork and coordination while using a control scheme with less of a brick wall-esque learning curve. It also uses the original story as a jumping off point to flesh out the world and expand on interesting threads that the original left behind, all while telling its own really effective story with its own cast. And it looks cool too. I was shocked at how well I remembered the Shibuya from the original, even though you explore it from new camera angles now that it's in full 3D. It's not running on the most intensive engine out there, but the developers still used it to make the city pop. Entui was a best case scenario, a sequel to a critically acclaimed cult hit that got just about everything right. So why aren't more people playing it? Well, I mean, I guess I answered that question up front, didn't I? If I survey 100 people and ask how many people have played the A New Day bonus episode of The World Ends With You Final Remix on the Nintendo Switch, survey would probably say nothing. And that's what Entui is a sequel to. Okay, Craig, you played it, I get it, but I'm going somewhere here. This is an issue that's been plaguing a lot of Square Enix titles lately. Kingdom Hearts is infamous for making every single spin-off crucial to the story. Final Fantasy VII Remake was all fun and games until it started referencing Dirge of Cerberus and oh god, I'm lost. God help me if the next Nier game makes the crossover raids from Final Fantasy XIV an important part of the next game's narrative. And with N. Tui, it feels especially cruel. This is a long-awaited sequel that actually turned out really good. The mechanics translated over to modern hardware really smoothly. The story is effective. Oh my god, the soundtrack is perfect. Again, it got just about everything right right. Like, the pacing was a bit rough at points, and that's it. That's the only complaint I can really muster. But it didn't sell well. 
And while I did see a lot of people bemoaning that on Twitter, I honestly can't blame folks for not hopping on the Tui train. I mean, like, if you're someone who played the DS original back in high school and you're feeling nostalgic in time for the sequel to come out, but then the sequel starts making references to things that happened in the awkward modern port that came out a few years ago, yeah. I'd peace out too. Following the stories of Square Enix's franchises is starting to feel less fun and more like work. And uh, I guess that's apparently the way they like it now. Neo The World Ends With You is an achievement. I think it's deserving of year-end recognition, but damn, Square Enix, you make it really hard these days. Oh my god, I cannot believe it took me this long to get around to Hitman. As someone who peruses a lot of the game design video essay world, Hitman is one of those franchises that's existed in my visual periphery a lot without me actually playing it. It's known for its crazy immersive sim sandboxes that have a gajillion ways in and out, so of course level design nuts like to gush about it. Deservedly so. But I didn't get around to it at first. It's always been one of those games that's like, you know what, I've heard a lot of cool things about that, so I'll buy it now that it's on sale and play it later. Tale as old as time. Anyway, when Hitman 3 came out, despite the epic game store game data transfer nonsense, I decided that this was going to be it. The time was now. The plan was thus pick up Hitman 3, import all of the levels from the previous games, and go through the whole thing as one massive campaign. And so, I bought it, jumped through all the hoops to get all of my accounts synced and all the levels into one game, and then I didn't touch it for months because I had a crippling Risk of Rain 2 addiction at the time. Classic DQP. But thankfully, I did get around to it by year's end, and oh my god, how did I miss this for five years? Wow, 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 wow. I understand why this trilogy took five years and many episodic releases to fully come out, because there's a lot of content here, but playing it as one straight campaign from Hitman 1 to Hitman 3 makes for a remarkably good, varied, and cathartic video game ride. It's a satirical power fantasy that has you stealthing around the world and doing absolutely hilarious violent things things to rich, powerful, and corrupt leaders who absolutely have it coming. I would go as far as to call it one of video gaming's best comedies, as the writing and mechanics meshed brilliantly to make me laugh harder than I have at most other games this year. This is an industrial cold storage unit. It easily reaches temperatures of minus 10 degrees Celsius. Trust me, you don't want to stay inside for long. Like. Sorry, Psychonauts and Deltarune, I know you're higher up the list, but nothing will top Agent 47 disguising himself as an egotistical whodunit detective, walking into a knives-out family murder mystery, solving the entire thing step by step, revealing everything to the family matriarch, and then pushing her off the balcony right after because she's your target. The trilogy's story isn't, like... Metal Gear Solid 3 good, because it has to flow around whatever insane dick dastardly schemes you devise to kill your targets, but it's still pretty good, especially now that it's all together and finished as one three-act story instead of disjointed episodes. Playing it all from beginning to end, Lord of the Rings movie marathon style, is a totally valid and recommended way to experience the whole thing. And if anything, it makes the story make more sense because a lot of the more complicated lore stuff actually stays in your brain as you play it. Of course, the big Sword of Damocles hanging over Hitman's head is the always online DRM that's inevitably going to shut down, rendering a lot of really important features moot. That's legit scary, and IO needs to patch the connectivity requirements out someday. And keep them out of Project 007, because that's also going to be killer. They won't. Investors probably like the live service -y stuff and the confusing consumer experience of actually buying the whole trilogy as one complete package, Game Pass releases notwithstanding. Which is a shame, because it's the one thing holding this incredible stealth comedy experience back. If you're willing to wade through all of that, the now-complete Hitman trilogy is an absolutely monumental achievement. But that is a big if.
It's going to be really awkward when this game actually comes out for real, and it will have featured on three of my yearly top 10 lists. Anyway, I did not have much of an opportunity to really talk about Deltarune when Chapter 1 hit back in 2018, which probably surprised a lot of you longtime viewers at the time, considering my inability to shut up about Undertale after that game came out. The simple answer is, I did not have the spoons at the time to deep dive into Deltarune like I did with Undertale. I played the core campaign in a few very small settings and thought that was great and put it down. I didn't even really fight the crazy bonus boss. What can I say? My brain was in a bad place. But things were apparently different in 2021 because I plowed through the entirety of Chapter 2 in almost a single sitting. That's five-ish hours of Deltarune in a single sitting. I couldn't manage that back in 2018. And honestly, that's a me change, not a Deltarune change. Chapter 2 is still about as funny and enjoyable as the first chapter was, which is to say, Quite. It did get me thinking a lot, however, because while I doubt it's going to stay this way, Deltarune is, like Hitman, sort of an episodically released game at the moment, and it's interesting seeing how different that feels to Undertale or other games like it. Like, can you imagine if Nintendo had released Super Paper Mario chapter by chapter instead of as a whole game? Even if you didn't change the story or the script at all, that would still wildly change the discourse and or marketing behind it. And it makes me wonder how much of Deltarune's story is influenced by how it's been released piecemeal so far. Would those edgy plot hooks at the end of each chapter still be there if the game weren't episodic? Under what capacity would those bonus bosses still be there? Would the hub worlds be designed differently? I mean, certainly at least Sans's dialogue about waiting three years wouldn't be there. It's an awkward point to make this statement because I don't even know how the rest of this game is going to be released, but I think it suits Deltarune. Deltarune, like Undertale, deals with themes of meta storytelling and player agency in control, but in such a way that leaves the player feeling more passive than in Undertale. Well, weird root notwithstanding. And that's not a complaint. The game is very aware of how relatively little agency the player has at this point, and seems to be doing some really interesting things in terms of setting up future payoffs. Releasing the game episodically gives the player time to reflect and chew on the symbolism and themes throughout while they wait for the next chapter. And, I mean, it probably also helps that the two chapters thus far are free and could run on a toaster. It's impossible to ignore that on top of everything else that made Undertale great, two big contributing factors to its popularity were its price and its low computing demands. Also, it's still just really damn funny. So, FYI, the next two entries on this list deal with personal trauma related to emotional abuse, so if you don't want to watch that, here's the time code for the games after that. And if you do skip the next two games, they are Unpacking and The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, and you should play them both. They're great. Okay, here we go. Unpacking kinda got me. For those not in the know, it's a puzzle game where you unpack boxes into a new living space. It's exactly what it says on the box. It's on Game Pass and you can finish it in an evening. Please play it. I'm going to spend the rest of this segment spoiling a couple specific levels, so if you don't want that, here's the time code for the next game. It's got Herlock Sholmes in it. It's great. All right, spoilers start here. A couple years ago, I moved in with a certain someone, and there's a level in unpacking that put me almost exactly back into that headspace of someone else's presence taking over so much of my personal space that it kind of dominated and overruled me. Unpacking's premise, on the surface, was fertile ground for mechanics-based storytelling. Early levels had you choosing where to put certain objects in new spaces, from a kid's bedroom, to a college dorm, to renting a house with your D&D buddies. Innocuous items are given newfound meaning when they're associated with certain spaces and certain friends, and seeing what stays in those boxes and what's let go is a good way to let someone express what's important to them. And then I hit that level. You move in with a romantic partner and the feeling is alien. They have a different video game console from you, their workout equipment takes up space that I felt I couldn't disturb, there's only one closet and one bed, and do you really think this guy would let me bring my stuffed animals there? It was a level that made me feel insignificant. Like my things were secondary to his, that they had to be hidden away, that I had to conform my personality and the objects they were associated with to mold around him and his belongings. It made me feel 
lesser. Like I was an accessory to this person, that I was sacrificing some core part of myself just to be a part of his life. And like, relationships are inherently scary in that way. Every relationship requires some sacrifices and compromises to make work. But at what point do those sacrifices erode your core self? At what point do you inherently lose yourself to a partner's ego? I remember by the time I got out of my abusive relationship, my friends could tell that I was suffering, that something was off about me and this person that I was with, that I was sort of crossing the line from sacrificing and compromising to make a relationship work to slowly ceasing to function as I used to. The unpacking levels that follow see the player move back into their old childhood bedroom after the breakup, and eventually into their own space again, and even find another romantic partner who now moves in with you, and you're given the opportunity to help sort their stuff in with yours. And it's kind of a humbling moment. Like, this person also has stuffed animals, and though they bring their own hobbies and fandoms into your life, they mingle with yours in a more coherent and healthy way. You're given the opportunity to let this other person express themselves in a way that I had felt scared to previously. And doing so doesn't really hurt you. It's reassuring to hear a game tell me, they're not all like this. <sighs> okay, thanks for letting me ramble. Next game. Okay, I'm sorry, this is like the third remaster on this list, but I don't care. This is the first time Americans got to, legally, play Daigyakuten Saibon. I mean, the Great Ace Attorney. So I think it deserves a spot here. Sue me. And out of convenience, I'm going to refer to it as DGS from now on because the Great Ace Attorney is kind of a mouthful. DGS is such an interesting beast that when I started it, it kind of took me aback and I realized, oh, that's right, I'm playing an Ace Attorney game. It's weird by Ace Attorney standards because it's a period piece set in an era of tense political struggles between two different powers who see the world in extremely different ways, where the racism and prejudices of Victorian era Britain are laid bare for a non-white protagonist to see, where different nationalist ideologies clash against each other, and where characters deal with the insecurities that they perceive in themselves as a result of all that. And also, at the same time, it is an Ace Attorney game. It is a game with characters like Beef Stroganov and Egert Benedict and Villain Borshevik and most infamously, Herlock Sholmes. Yo, nice LeBlanc reference. Like any good Ace Attorney game, the set pieces are absolutely buck wild kangaroo court cases where prosecutors dramatically fling wine bottles away and witnesses can freely abuse their partners on the stand and the jury can just instantly reach a verdict mid cross examination, but don't worry, you can use your magical ace attorney lawyer skills to subvert that verdict. For as historically frank as DGS can be, it is also simultaneously capable of just as much camp and stupidity as any other ace attorney game, and I would not have it any other way. All that said, this is the first Ace Attorney game I've played since, like, the original DS years, and it was interesting rediscovering this franchise after so long, and after so many things had changed in my own life. Early on, in the first case, protagonist Ryonosuke Naruhodo, official name, must defend himself in court against accusation after accusation, and the act of accurately defending yourself against everything the prosecutor and witnesses fling at you, while very silly per the Ace Attorney norm, was also shockingly therapeutic. Therapeutic? This is a general Ace Attorney thing and not just a DGS thing, but it was cathartic to slip into Ryanosuke's shoes and successfully defend myself, to stand my ground and affirm that there's more to be understood about the situation at hand. Like, I don't know. I played the first couple Ace Attorney games when I was in high school and I thought that that was neat, and I'm sitting here half my life later and the same phenomenon feels far different. I know, I don't want to play the same emotional abuse experience sad song that I always seem to play nowadays, including literally the last entry of this list, but it's led me to appreciate this series on a deeper level than I did before. After having my own perspectives invalidated and gaslit away by both an abusive partner and an abusive co-worker for a stretch of time, it's cathartic to assume the role of a fictional super lawyer and work to reach an empirical truth. I'll welcome that. Ryanosuke deals with a lot of imposter syndrome in DGS, and that comes from a variety of factors. His traumatic experiences at the beginning of the adventure, being a foreigner in a colonialist empire where people are quick to assume from him extreme ignorance at best and genuine malice at worst, and being thrown into a system that is, as everyone tells him, the most sophisticated legal system in the world, one that he may not be quote-unquote worthy of. 
And again, this is despite the fact that their courtrooms are Ace Attorney levels of batshit insane. Hey, it's almost like the Ace Attorney camp is being deliberately invoked to explore deeper psychological and geopolitical themes or something. DGS was great for me to play this year, and despite how nightmarish it must have been to localize, both from Japanese to English and from 3DS to modern platforms, I'm really happy that I got the opportunity to legally play it. And, uh, Capcom? As a consumer with spendable capital, I speak from the bottom of my heart when I say, please make and or localize more of these. You know, I'm something of a content creator myself. <laughs> and like being a super lawyer, a part of that has always come with an unhealthy amount of imposter syndrome. Like, obviously, I don't think I'm kidding anyone with those consistently low view counts on my videos. But even outside this YouTube channel and into my broader work, my brain is scarily capable of convincing me that I'm not worthy to create, or that nobody cares about the work I do, or that I'm a master fraud who is swindling people out of their money with the power of my sheer mediocrity. None of that is true. The fact that I still still have regular viewers on YouTube and a steady paycheck at my job is a testament that people love and appreciate what I do. I'm willing to bet that if you're a regular subscriber who's hit the bell icon, hint hint, you'd probably be incredibly disappointed if I decided to up and call the YouTube thing quits. And yet, anxiety and imposter syndrome still exist, as they exist for most creatives. And it's for that reason that, like DGS, I found Chicory a Colorful Tale to be surprisingly therapeutic. If you haven't played it, it's basically a link to the past, except you color in the world like a coloring book instead of fighting monsters. I mean, okay, there are a few boss fights, but the bulk of the game is basically spent coloring these screens in one by one. In terms of gameplay, that's mostly it. There are a few Zelda-y power-ups that let you move around the world in new ways and unlock new areas, but 9 hours out of 10, you're going to be painstakingly coloring everything in. Well, I did anyway. It was the game's writing that really gripped me, though. There's a calamity where the world loses its color, and your player character picks up a legendary magic brush and becomes the chosen one destined to color the world back in, complete with the usual tough questions and insecurities that come with chosen one narratives, while also exploring the dark and scary mental health issues that come with being a creative of any kind. Chicory is not the name of the player character, but rather the previous chosen one, who fluctuates between adversary and mentor figure as the game goes on. The game ultimately acts as a character study of Chicory, who struggles with serious self-esteem problems, depression, and self-doubt. At first, I found the prospect of painting in this entire world map, plus dungeons, to be exhaustingly tedious, but after a while, it stopped being monotonous and started being meditative instead, as NPCs started admiring my work and commenting on it, and coupling that with exploring Chicory's mental well-being and the roots of her depression made for an opportunity to reflect on my own anxieties about my creative process. And it's not often that a video game lets me do that. So, yeah, thanks Greg, and Alexis, and Lena, and M, and Madeline, and friends. Your game kinda kept me going throughout this year. I appreciate that. They did it. The crazy sons of bitches, they did it. This feels surreal to talk about. Metroid Dread has been something that I thought would never happen since, like, middle school. If you had told me this game would be here in this video at the beginning of 2021, I'd probably have been like, what? No, Metroid no, no, Metroid Dread, that game's a myth. But here we are. Not only does it exist, it's actually, like, one of the best Metroidvanias of the year. And again, stacked genre this year. Samus feels the best control she's probably ever felt. They tweaked the melee counter from Samus Returns so that, instead of killing the pacing every time you use it, it's one of the best new additions to her arsenal. The speed booster is just perfect in every way. Criminally, it introduced us to one of the coolest antagonists that Metroid's ever had just days after the last character was added to Smash Ultimate. Like, don't get me wrong, I love that Sora's in Smash now, but can you imagine how fun it'd be to fight as this dude? And the map and the music are… fine. They're fine. The level design is a little invisible handy for my tastes, and the music is… well, it's… it's serviceable, it gets the job done, but those are really, really small blemishes. The 11 year old inside me is insanely happy that not only does Metroid Dread actually exist, but it's one of the best games in a franchise that's already really important to me. Mercury Steam really killed it with this one. That being said… 
2020 and 2021 have been massive rude awakenings for video game development in general. Multiple companies have either faced or are facing legal scrutiny for their sexist work environments, and public scrutiny for their brutal, unfair, and manipulative working conditions. And while Metroid Dread was one of my favorite games of the year, it would be in poor taste for me not to mention that it reportedly really sucked to make it. Artists at Mercury Steam told stories this year of strict and contradictory management that did not value those below them. Said management reportedly fostered an environment of fear that discouraged speaking publicly about working conditions. Probably most heinously, due to an arbitrary company policy, at least 50 artists and developers went uncredited. As much as I loved seeing a new 2D Metroid game again after all this time, and as incredible as the final product turned out to be, I would not want to see those lower level developers go through this again. A lot of them did absolutely astounding work suffered for it, and ultimately had to go uncredited. Metroid Dread is an accomplishment, but I do not want Mercury Steam to walk away with the Game Award for Best Action Adventure with the impression that Metroid Dread was an accomplishment because of their brutal work ethic. Metroid Dread is an accomplishment in spite of Mercury Steam's brutal work ethic not because of. And just because they made one of the best games of the year doesn't mean that they shouldn't do better. More people need to come out with stories about this kind of thing, and not just at the studios we already hate. Okay, let's wrap this up on a positive note. You know those perfect sequels, the ones that improve on nearly everything that the original did while expanding on the mythos and characters? Yeah, Psychonauts 2 is one of those. Like, Holy cow, it is actually one of those. Double Fine went for a home run and the ball left the stratosphere and knocked a TV satellite out of orbit. Like, that much one of those. The first Psychonauts was, in my opinion, a really interesting but also really undercooked game. And it was plain to see why people clamored for a sequel for years. I mean, it's a killer concept, a collectathon platformer a la Banjo Kazooie, where every level is based on the inner thoughts of a different character. Like, come on, Persona 5, but with more empathy and better pacing. That's an amazing idea. The original was, unfortunately, a bit fraught. Like, people remember it fondly for a reason, but it suffers from some jank, a few levels that feel unfocused, too many collectibles, and, uh, not always so great handling of its mental health subject matter. Maybe mental health portrayal in pop culture was just in a different place in the mid-aughts. So it's a relief that Psychonauts 2 saw fit to correct every single one of those issues. All of them. Jank? Mostly gone. Unfocused levels? Not anymore. Too many collectibles? Streamlined, but there's still a lot of room for exploration and secrets. Not always so great handling of its mental health subject matter? Double Fine overcorrected to the point that Psychonauts 2 is a powerful meditation on the power of compassion, patience, trauma, and healing. One of the best aspects of the original that Double Fine leaned hard into with the sequel was that through its level design, you got to see the world through the points of view of every brain you crawl into. That meant that everything from enemy placement to level design could be used to convey some aspect of someone's emotional place. Even when the original oversimplified a lot of serious mental health problems, you still at least got to walk around in the shoes of the people that had them. Psychonauts 2 has the almighty gift of 2020 hindsight and years of mental illness destigmatization on its side, and that means that not one of its major level based characters is simplified for a joke or brushed aside so that the plot can progress. And that's not even mentioning that the platforming has been improved to such a degree that moving around the levels is lots of fun. And like the original, the levels are just overflowing with cool ass design ideas that put lots of different abilities to the test in interesting ways. The end result is a game that's powerful, emotionally rich, genuinely wholesome, plays really well, and like Deltarune, still just really damn funny. Where'd you learn how to make pancakes? Prison. And there's room for more sequels. I really hope Microsoft lets Double Fine make more of these. If ever there was a game this year that's deserving of being franchise material, this is it. So that was 2021. If 2020 showed the world how important video games could be, then 2021 showed me that I'm so 
goddamn tired of them. I sat back and regrettably watched the Game Awards this year, and to be honest, the only reaction I could muster to anything there was muted, bitter disappointment. 2021 showed us that massive game companies will continue to be complicit with sexual harassment, with crunch, with malicious FOMO game design, and now this NFT blockchain shit? No matter how many people walk out or strike, they'll continue to find ways to keep players hooked onto their live services. Work employees to death to create software that will work players to death. Entertainment be damned. <sighs> I'm, I'm sorry, that's a very simplistic and angry way of looking at it. Plenty of game companies are out there still wanting to make fun games in ways that are healthy for both their players and their employees. Hell, one of the biggest examples of that in 2021, reportedly, was IDOS Montreal, a subsidiary of Square Enix. Wild. But it's becoming increasingly clear where entertainment and tech companies ultimately want this to go. Or rather, where their shareholders want this to go. And it makes me sad. Disappointed, weary, and sad. I know people are like, 2022 is going to be a super strong year for video games because all the big ones got delayed to this year, and just... Whatever. I look at the release schedule for 2022, and I'm excited for Weird West, Elden Ring, Kirby, Bomb Rush, Cyberfunk, Sea of Stars, and yeah, that's kind of it. Maybe Breath of the Wild 2 and Silk Song if those are still real. I'll also concede that Legends Arceus is really good. So I'm thinking I'm going to spend 2022 taking a break from this. Oh no, not YouTube. I've still got videos I want to make this year, don't worry. But this this end of year top 10 thing, this pressure to find 10 new games that came out this year that I can genuinely enjoy, this pressure to buy games instantly at full price as soon as they come out so I can make stuff in a timely fashion so that I have time to play everything new. I, I can't this year, maybe not anymore at all. So you know what? Fuck it. Here's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to spite the likes of Yosuke Masuda and Eve Jimo personally. I'm playing games for fun this year. I'm going to play the games I want to play, whether they're new or not. If I feel like making a video about them, great. If not, also great. See y'all at the next upload, whenever that is. Probably soonish. Ah,